Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and this is a review of Canon's 200 to 800 millimeter F6 III to F9 IS USM RF lens. Now this is a super unique lens because no one else makes something that goes from 200 all the way out to 800. Now, of course, Nikon, Sony, Sigma, Tamron have lenses that go up to 600 millimeters and they have slightly lower apertures, but this takes that to an extreme, 200 to 800. Now, there are pros and cons, and we're gonna go over all of those throughout this video so that you can decide if this is the right lens for you, but it's also important to note that we've reviewed the Nikon 180 to 600 and the Sony 200 to 600, so if you want to check those out. We do have reviews on those as well, but this is about this 200 to 800 and it is super unique. So let's get into the outside of the lens. This is it. Let me show you the zoom. That is what happens to it. It's not an internal zooming lens. It is external zooming. So as you turn the zoom ring, it goes all the way out. And that might be a con for some people because it changes the balance and feel of the lens. And I'll get into the weights in just a second, but let's take a look at the rest of the outside of the lens. So as you can see, it has this nice white paint. You might be saying, Jared, is that the same paint that you find on something like this 100 to 500 or maybe a 400 2.8, even though it looks like it's the same white, it's not the same reflective coating that you find on the pro type of lenses. So I don't know why Canon thought that was important to tell us, but it is slightly different. You have two of your custom function buttons on here. You have two switches on the side. You've got your manual and autofocus switch, and you have stabilization on and off because you do have IS built into this lens. But what you don't have is a stabilization one, two, and three setting that you find on the higher end Canon lenses. Now Canon says when you are panning with this lens, it has an auto detect feature that will change the IS to B for panning. Some people like having a switch for that, but with the price of this lens, which we'll get to at the end of this, you will understand why they had to make some trade-offs and some compromises, and I think at the end of the day, they are well worth it. Now, the control ring that is usually at the end of Canon lenses has been moved to the closest point here because it, you know, you can't reach out to the end when you're zooming it. It wouldn't be a great place to have it, but this does double duty. You could have it be a control ring to control what you'd like it to control, or if you want to do manual focusing, you can use it for manual focusing, but I think most people will be using this in full auto. Now, the next ring you have on this lens is a tension ring. So you can go from smooth to tight, and that's going to determine how smooth and how tight the zoom feels. Now, it could be like Rob Thomas, or I don't really have a good example of what a musician would be for tight, but let me know down below what you think a musician comes to mind when you say tight. Now, what I will say is, you know, Right now I have it on, well, this is on tight, so I'm turning it and it's, it's fine. And I want it to be on smooth, so it is a little bit more smooth. But what I will say is as you zoom this lens out, the balance gets thrown off ever so slightly because it has an extremely long throw. What I mean by throw is how quickly I can rotate from 200 to 800 and how awkward it is. Look at this. I'm twisting all the way over so that I can twist all the way under like this. That is a long way to go. And remember, when you're shooting photos, that's gonna throw your balance off. So it might be better to do these little turns while you're doing it, or if you put this on a monopod, I tried to put my hand on top and do a smooth zoom that I would do with like, say the 100 to 300, and it just isn't capable of doing that. So it's just something to be aware of that it's an awkward, long way to go to go from 200 to 800. Now let's talk about the weight. This lens comes in at 4.5 pounds or 2,041 grams, which honestly isn't that bad. It is a hand holdable lens. And I did most of my shooting hand holding, but it does get a little awkward after a little bit of time when you're trying to zoom and you're trying to shoot at the same time because you're constantly being thrown off axis because of how you have to turn and zoom this. 
But some people might find that if they're going to be birders or wildlife shooters and they're going to be standing around or sitting around for a while in the same position, you might want to try it on a monopod or a tripod. You're just going to get, have to get used to how you're going to want to zoom it. You're going to have to find what works best for you. But it is a nice feeling lens. It doesn't feel super cheap. It doesn't feel plasticky. It feels fine in the hands. In terms of length, this thing comes in at 12.4 inches or 315 millimeters which is the same that you have with uh, Sony's 200 to 600. But when you zoom the 200 to 600 from Sony, nothing extends out. Nothing's happening. It's not extending. And as you've seen 15 times already, this thing is an external zooming lens. Now, since I mentioned using a monopod, this is your tripod collar. This does not come off. I can loosen it. I can be like, hey, I want you to come off. But nope, it's just going to spin you right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby, right round, round, round. Um, it also doesn't have any click stops. And I give a lot of companies crap when their lenses don't have click stops for when you're using the monopod or the tripod collar because I like to know what exact center is. When I'm vertical or horizontal, I want to know clicking in so that I know that that is flush and I can change my body and move my body to bend where I need it to bend to get my lines and angles straight. I wish this could be taken off because it does get in the way for me. But again, if you're using a tripod or a monopod, pod, it's something that you're going to have to get used to. Now, usually on bigger telephoto lenses from Nikon, Canon, or Sony, you do have the option for a drop-in filter in the back. Now, this doesn't have that option, but you do have in the front a 95 millimeter lens cap and filter thread. So if you want to put a filter on the end of it, which I do not recommend doing a daylight filter or a UV filter, I don't believe in those. I still don't believe in those in those to this day, because most people say it's to protect your lens. I do not want to put a piece of glass in front of my good piece of glass. I risk it, I do it, I've been doing it for years, that's what I recommend. Now, if you need to put on variable ND filters or just ND filters in front of it or polarizers, you know that you can get a 95 millimeter filter. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you all of the presets from Fropac 4 in action on this photo taken with the 200 to 800 Canon, starting with Blue's Clues, followed by Brooklyn, C41, Copper Tone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick with multiple C's, Tin Type, and Wet Hot American Summer. But now, let me show you Skittles in action from Fropac 1 with one click and boom. Look, if you want to speed up your raw workflow, give yourself a great starting point, or you're just tired of other people's presets sucking and you want ones that work, well, we created 14 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to get the Grand Slam bundle that includes Fropack 1, 2, 3, and 4, and of course has Skittles, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the review. Now, I want to show you examples of what a 200 looks like with this cheetah at the zoo. So we've got the cheetah sitting here. We're at 200 millimeters. But all the way out at 800, look at what I'm able to get. Look at the hair of that cheetah. It was raining. And because it was overcast and raining, I knew I had to bump my ISO up higher. This is one of those cons of having an F9 lens is that you need to bump your ISO to give yourself a shutter speed that is hand holdable or usable to capture the subject that you're photographing. In this case, I'm at 1 640th and F9 at ISO 4000. Now, if the cheetah was about to run and attack something, which it can't do at the zoo, then I would know that I need to bump that ISO up higher to give myself an even faster shutter speed so I don't end up with blur if I don't want that motion blur. Always keep that in mind. And another thing I want to show you here is what does 600 millimeters look like? This is 600 millimeters. This is basically the max you're going to get from other manufacturers out there. And what you get with the 200 to 800 is the ability to go how much further, Stephen? 200, Two, 200 more. It's like going to 11. But yeah, you get that extra reach. And to me, that extra reach is more valuable than having, say, an F6.3 or F7.1. With that being said, 6.3 to 9, I know it sounds like it's a ton of stops. It's one stop. You're not losing that much, but you're gaining the 
from 600 to 800. That's the difference. But you also need to be aware of the, the lighting situations. Whereas the next day when I went back to the zoo, it was a much brighter day. So I was able to drop the ISO quite a bit and still have a good enough shutter speed. Now, speaking of shutter speed, you know you have IS in this lens. Now you get five and a half stops of image stabilization when you're out at 800 millimeters. Now when you're at the 200 millimeter end, you're gonna get 7.5 stops of image stabilization when you're paired with a camera that has IS built in. But that doesn't mean that you can shoot at super slow shutter speeds and still expect to get sharp images if a subject is moving. I've said this for years. You could shoot at 1 30th of a second handheld if you're gonna shoot something that's not moving, but if you're gonna photograph, say, a bird or a bear just sitting there and they're doing any type of movement, a 30th of a second isn't going to work. So you just have to keep in the back of your mind how fast of a shutter speed do I need to have for the subject that I'm photographing. Now, one of the biggest questions that people always have with these variable aperture lenses is where does the aperture change as you're zooming? So so at 200 millimeters, of course you're at 6.3, but at 268, it goes to 7.1. And at 455, you go to F8. And at 637 to all the way out to 800 is F8. Nine. So it's slightly different than a 200 to 600 or a 180 to 600 that is a 6.3 lens all the way out at 600. But again, size, weight, these things are all a trade-off. Do you want the longer lens, the more reach, and trading that extra stop of light, which isn't that big of a deal in this day and age, because I rather have the longer 600 to 800 because it comes in handy more often, especially for those birders who are shooting those small birds, less cropping is needed and it should lead to cleaner images. Even though you need to raise your ISO, I still rather have you not crop as much as possible. Now, with all of that being said, if you want to put a 1.4 or a 2X converter on here, you're more than welcome to do it. If you don't have a lot of light, you're going to be at 25,600 or more. So just understand you're not going to get that great or clean of images when you try to throw on a converter that's a 1.4 where you lose a stop of light. And when you put a 2X, you lose two stops of light. You're looking at F18. It's not gonna be very easy and you're not gonna get great quality images. Now we did do a test with the 100 to 500 from Canon with the converters on and we showed that it was just better to honestly crop after the fact better quality than putting those converters onto the lens. You already saw that I photographed the cheetahs which at the Philadelphia Zoo, they, they actually move their enclosure closer to the people so that they're sitting there. Cause usually in the, in the, in the old days, they had a, an enclosure that was further back and when the cheetahs were on top sleeping, you could couldn't see them. Now you can see them. But directly across from the cheetahs, you have the eagles. So I always go over to the eagles to photograph them because they just they just sit there. So let's zoom in on this eagle photo at 800 millimeters. The eye looks fantastic. I mean, we are at F9. So you have a little bit more leeway when you're shooting at F9 and filling that frame to basically get things in focus. So this is 800. This is what 200 looks like. You have everything in between. Just again, understand as you're zooming while you're shooting, it's going to be a little more awkward. You're going to have to figure out how to get your composition right. And that's going to be different for each one of you. But having the option to go from 200 to 800 is fantastic in a wildlife and nature situation. Not so much the zoo. I mean, it's perfect in the zoo because they're not going anywhere, but in the real world, you will find that that is super useful and super helpful. Now, just for fun, let's show you a horizontal of the eagle at 800 millimeters. It's a nice portrait, right? And remember, this was during an overcast day. So I'm at 4,000 ISO again at 1 640th of a second, but it looks great. Now I did bang this photo out with some Skittles, which really has in the past has been perfect for when I've shot these eagles at the Philadelphia Zoo. When you zoom in, the eye looks perfect. It looks fantastic. So usually when I'm done photographing the eagles, the last stop that I like to make is, is the flamingos. I just like having that different color pop in a shot. So I walked over there, 800 millimeters. We're at 1 12 50th of a second at F9, 4,000 ISO, and I love how the background looks here. Now this isn't really the lens being put to, to, to work here. With It's just how the water is. It's how the out of focus area starts to look with the water. I just love how it dissipates in the background and gives me a nice tight focus on the flamingo and a not distracting background in this situation. 
Since we're talking about the background, let's talk about how many aperture blades you have. You have nine aperture blades. Uh, another thing that you might want to know is, is how close you can get when it's close focusing. Well, at 200 millimeters, you can get within 2.6 feet of your subject and still get autofocus. And at 800 millimeters, 9.2 feet is the closest you can get when trying to get autofocus to click in. Since I went to the zoo and it was an overcast day, and I knew that the next day was gonna be sunny, I decided to go back to the zoo the second day so that I would have much better lighting and I could drop the ISO down. And one of the things that I photographed was this thing. It's like a monkey, but I don't know which kind it is. But my ISO here is at 800 and I'm up at one two thousandth of a second because this guy was running all around the enclosure and I was doing my best to capture him and this one 800 millimeters, no, I'm at 707 millimeters. So this time I'm at 707 millimeters. So even there, that's something that you wouldn't get with obviously a 200 to 600. And of course, I went back to the flamingos before I left and I got a very nice tight shot of a flamingo. And you can see in the background that it's not distracting. Even though we're at F9, it's not really there in focus. But for this photo of the cheetah, you can see that there's like a play ball that's hanging up on the tree behind them and you can see that at f9 it's there so is it a distraction in some ways yes so you have to be careful with a lens like this to see what your backgrounds are going to look like because if you're shooting a soccer game and your kid is playing and you see the other side of the field and there's porto potties and parents yelling and stuff happening over there, most of that's gonna be in focus at F9 when you're all the way zoomed out to 800. That's just the nature of the beast. Let me cut in here real quick and let you know this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for my personal site for almost 15 years now. 15 because it's simple, easy, affordable, and I still don't need to know any coding. In fact, it only took me a few minutes to put up a new gallery of my Safari photos from Kenya. So if you'd like to try out Squarespace, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get your 14 day free trial. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, since I wanted to also photograph some action, I went out into the park where I borrowed little Dan, which is Dan's son, you know, Dan is Dan and he's little Dan. And I just wanted him to run around. And quickly I realized that well, 200 to 800 is pretty much overkill in a situation that's enclosed, but I needed to test it for autofocus because you have one USM motor inside of this lens. You don't have two, two would be better, but two would also be more expensive. I didn't find that when he was running at me that I missed focus and I was shooting at 30 frames a second and most people are probably not going to be shooting at 30 frames per second at this time but I think it did perfectly fine and tracked the subject just as I expected it to do. So it worked perfectly fine for little Dan running but I also wanted to try and get some 800 millimeter portraits. No don't lick the ground. From a distance. From a distance. You don't want to hear me sing. But this is at 800 millimeters. We're at 1 400th of a second, F9 at 2500 ISO. This was right around sundown, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the sun was going down. So it was pretty strong off to the side, which was creating some of that split lighting. But I'm happy with the portrait itself, but I wanna point out the shoe behind him. Now it is blurring out just a little bit, and that's even at F9, it's blurring out. And the background, which behind him is chain link fence is totally gone. You don't see it because he's far away from that background. But when we move on to the next image and he's laying down on the ground, I'm at 242 millimeters, then you can see that some of the background is there. Ideally, if you're in this situation where you're gonna be photographing at a park and a kid playing, this 200 to 800 is, is probably not the right choice. A 100 to 400 like this, or a 100 to 500, or even a 70 to 200 is gonna be an even better choice for when kids are running around the park. Now with the next shot, I pulled back more because I wanted to get all of little Dan in there and I'm at 288 millimeters. So of course, that's longer than a 200 millimeter would give you, but really good for a 180 to 600 or a 200 to 600. In this case, 200 to 800, and he looks good. But you can see 
part of the swing set behind. That's what that seat is. That's for one of those little kids to go onto the swing set. And I find the background to be perfectly fine and not a distraction in this situation. Now, at the very end of this video, I'm gonna run a slideshow with more images so you can see what I was able to capture. But how much is this lens? I would have thought when I heard a 200 to 800, I was thinking 2,600, $2,800, under $3,000. But the fact that it is a $1,900 lens was kind of shocking to me. I didn't expect a 200 to 800 to be priced under $2,000. And this also brings up that whole debate about Canon opening up their RF mount. If they're able to put out lenses that are less expensive and still really nice quality, do you need the third party support? And the answer to that is, I think they should open it up for Sigma and Tamron to do it, but still keep it closed for those other manufacturers that might not give them the quality that they're looking for. But it would be tough for Sigma to come out with a lens like this or Tamron to come out with a lens like this in a very similar price point. Because if they came out with it, I think it maybe would be 17 or 1800 dollars versus 1900 so a big shout out to canon for making this affordable at least for the people when you put it into comparison to something like a 600 f4 or a 100 to 300 there's nothing like it now yes canon offered us a 600 and an 800 f11 these two added up are 100 bucks less than this bad boy itself now yeah this is heavier and these are lighter and easier to carry around but the versatility is well worth it because you go from 200 to 800. Now for people that are just starting out that might not need something like this, you've got the 100 to 400 RF, which is a super affordable lens at 600 bucks. This is a great lens for somebody who just needs that reach of 100 to 400 outside. Of course you have the option of a 100 to 500 L for $2,900. I wouldn't take that. I mean, yeah, it's smaller, but it's a 100 to 500. I think this is a, a great lens. And who I think it's for are those wildlife photographers, those birders, those people who are never dropping 10, 12, 15, $16,000 on lenses because they shouldn't have to. And they don't have to, and they don't need it. For the everyday person that wants to go out or even go on a safari, this could be that one lens for the safari that rules them all for you. You just have to be aware of those cons of bumping that ISO up higher because of the fact that it's an F9. Now, two more things. We've got sniff test and wind tunnel test. I'm gonna stack it up like this for the wind tunnel test. Let's see how it does. Cause I mean, it looks like the Artemis rocket to me right here, but it's like, it's like the refrigerator, um, Refrigerator Perry on, on the bears back in the day. It is immovable, which means it fails the wind tunnel test. Let's see how it does with the sniffy sniff test, AKA mm, the sniff test. Oh, it smells like Godiva chocolate. I like chocolate. I like milk chocolate with caramel inside. That's what it smells like. So it passes the sniff test. So at the end of the day, you have to decide, is this the lens that is right for you? I think the 200 to 800 is a must have for a wildlife nature photographer who has under $2,000 to spend. I don't think you can go wrong with the extra reach. You do have some of those cons as I've mentioned throughout the video. So you have to weigh those options and decide, is it the best choice for you? Thank you guys very much for watching. Stick around for that slideshow. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.